Hey guys, Earl here with CSI, bringing you another episode of FAQs. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about grout. We get asked a lot of questions about grout. In fact, this week, we did some services for grout, grout cleaning, and the client had some questions and concerns before, during, and after the service. So, knowing that we get a lot of these questions and people email us all the time and we get calls, I want to go over grout as a whole, as what is it, the services that we can do, some of the problems we encounter, some of the challenges we face. So to help kind of clear things up with all these issues around grout. Okay, so let's start with what is grout. Well, to make it quite simple, grout is Portland cement with sand and pigment. And when these things are all combined, it's the ready-made product that you see on the shelf, uh, kind of like a powdery form, like a mortar form. And when you add water to it, you activate the ingredient, just like cement, that makes it bond. So what is it typically we see? So grout generally has three general categories. The first one is sanded grout. Sanded grout is exactly that, Portland cement with sand and a pigment. Typically, you would see sanded grout in an application where you're using porcelain or ceramic tile. The reason for that is sanded grout has more body. It's a bigger fill and it's more sturdy. And with porcelain and ceramic installations, normally you see thicker grout lines up to quarter inch and I've even seen some 3.8s, but it's not very common. So on a bigger, thicker grout line, you would typically see sanded grout because, again, it has more uh, body. It's more sturdy and stable, and it, it just holds better. So where don't they use sanded grout? Well, you wouldn't see sanded grout in an application where there's natural stone natural stone covering the categories of marble, granite, limestone, travertine, terrazzo tiles, onyx, and things of that nature. And the reason why you don't use sanded grout with natural stone is once you mix the grout and you apply it into your grout line, typically you would see your trowels, your rubber float, and you, you push with that float and push the grout into grout lines. Well, what happens is when you have sanded grout and you use it on natural stone, that sand, as you push it in, will create scratches on the stone surface, which can only be removed by restoration or basically a wet sanding process to get out all the scratches that were created by that sand that's in the grout. So with that said, that transition that transitions us into our next category, which is unsanded grout. Unsanded grout basically is Portland cement with a pigment, no sand. And typically, you would see this in an installation where there is natural stone, such as marble, granite, limestone, travertine, etc. And the reason why you use non-sanded grout is when you trowel this stuff in with that rubber float, it does not create scratches. So. With that said, typically in natural stone, you would see smaller grout lines just because the, the unsanded grout has less body and will tend to pop out more. It doesn't hold as strong as a sanded grout. In the third category, normally you would see in uh, glazed ceramics and glazed porcelains is epoxy grout. Epoxy grout normally you would see in a kitchen also with uh, red clay tiles saltillo mexican tiles so those are used in those applications and commercial bathrooms basically it's grout with epoxy in it it's sanded grout with epoxy and the quick way to tell if something has epoxy grout is if you look at the grout line you would typically see a sheen on the surface kind of plasticky look and so visually that's the easiest way to identify epoxy grout. Now, 
if you're looking at three different grouts and you're really not sure what it is, let me give you a kind of a cheat code. Take your nail, right, and run your nail in the grout line. Like that. Like you're filing your nail down. If you have sanded grout and you look at your nail, you're going to see it'll actually file your nail down because the sand in the grout is very abrasive. Now, if you do the same thing and you see that the grout line starts to powder up, just like baby powder, and you see your nail and your nail is not really, you don't see the scratches on your nail, that would be unsanded grout. The same thing on epoxy. You take your nail and you run it across the grout line. And you look up, you might see some discoloration on your nail, but it feels like a plasticky film. And you see the, the grout line is really not disturbed. That's epoxy grout. And the reason why is that epoxy creates like a film on top, like a plasticky feeling film on top of the grout line making it more durable and more resistant to dirt and staining. So right there you have your three general categories. And of course, with the new products coming out, they're being very innovative in um, creating synthetic blends, poly blends, things that they put into the admixture for better curing, strength, and stain resistance. But overall, what I'm talking about is the three general categories of grout that we common, commonly see every day in homes and in commercial settings. So with that said, what are some of the issues that we face in grout? Well, like we said, generally speaking, it is Portland cement. Some of it has sand, some of it doesn't. So knowing that it's cement, like your driveway, if you spill something on your driveway and your driveway is unsealed, the liquids will absorb just like when it rains and your driveway darkens. So in this particular case, when it comes to grout, in your shower or on your floor, or any area that gets wet a lot, that grout absorbs. And it gets dingy and discolored. So in a quick way to tell that is find the edge of the room and you'll notice the grout is a different color hue than in the middle of the room where there's high traffic. This will tell you your wear pattern and your traffic pattern. So because it's cement and it's porous by nature, as we clean it, as we walk on it, sweep it, so forth and so on, soil collects in that grout line because the grout line is recessed from the top of the tile. Well, slightly, maybe 1 16th of an inch, there's a slight recess. So if you saw the contour of the surface would go like this, It'll go down just a little bit, come right back up to the next tile, and level. And because it naturally has that little dip, soil will collect there, and as you mop and clean it, so will your cleaning solutions. So, when you have a cleaning solution like an alkaline solution, degreaser, whatever you're using, and that solution collects in the grout line and it's not rinsed out, that solution becomes a magnet for soil because what a soap's job is to do is to attract soil, right? So let's say you spray it with your flat mop or a regular mop, whatever the case may be. When you mix your cleaning solution into the water, you change the pH of your water, making it an alkaline solution for cleaning. And because most of us don't vacuum our, you know, like wet vacuum our floor, extract our floor, through time, the grout lines collect that solution and give it an alkaline pH. And as we know in our industry, soil is acidic by pH. And that's why soaps are alkaline. Acid and alkaline attract each other to find balance and neutralize. So as you're cleaning your house or your commercial facility, that soap collects in the grout line. That Soap that collects in the grout line gets absorbed into the grout, making it a magnet for soil, thus causing resoiling and redarkening of those grout lines through time. It's unavoidable because floors get walked on, they get driven on, so forth and so on. We move things across the floor. 
and everything because of gravity comes down. So I want to talk about our cleaning solution and what is it that we do? Well, soil in, on many surfaces is addressed by four basic elements of cleaning. One is solution, that's your chemicals, your chemistry. Number two is heat. Number three is extraction or vacuum. And number four is agitation. So that is our cleaning pie. If you took that, split it in four, those are the four elements that we work with. So whether it's our cleaning method, somebody else's, or another company's, it really falls on the technician and um, the company's SOPs to set a standard of clean of how to do things. In a perfect world, we can use all four elements to clean your surface. However, due to the nature of your building or your home or what's surrounding the work area, sometimes we're limited to a certain degree of chemistry because you don't want to ruin the baseboard or what's around there. Or you're limited to a certain degree of heat or vacuum or agitation even. All these things are determined by the scope of work, which is determined ultimately by what are we cleaning, where are we cleaning it, what is around it, who inhabits the space, and just all these factors combined because you want to use the strongest thing to get the best clean, you know, you're excited about it, but maybe there are young children or kids in the house or pets that are very close to the ground surface and maybe somebody in the home is uh, allerg like a, uh, hypoallergenic or no, allerg allergic, has allergic reactions and uh, asthma and things like that where they have, uh, they're, they're breathing impaired. And so being careful with chemistry is very important. As you know, you can smell some chemistry and it'll cause you to sneeze. It can even put you in the hospital. So with that said, how we set our standard of clean is based on where we're cleaning, who in, who's in the space, and what we're cleaning around. But ultimately, there's four elements of cleaning that we have to use and determine and use our professional knowledge and wisdom in order to determine what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. For, for instance, um, we do a lot of tiling route cleaning in high rises. Well, we have a very powerful truck mounted unit that produces about 230 degrees of heat and enough vacuum to pull through about 800 feet of hose. That's a long linear pull. However, in a high rise, we can't use that. So what do we have to do? Well, we have to use a portable vacuum. We have to use, uh, we have a portable steamer, a vapor steamer that produces roughly around 330 degrees of heat at 50 or 60 PSI in which case we don't have the water pressure. We got vacuum, but we got tremendous heat, and then we have chemistry, and we can also agitate the grout lines manually or use mechanical scrubbers in order to get the best cleaning result. So that's just an example of um, what we deal with in the field based on location and everything else. So let me kind of just backtrack a little bit so I explained to you how grouting gets soiled, why it gets soiled, because it's a porous material. In a shower, things change now. We're in a wet environment with soap, dead skin, all these other elements. So in this kind of situation, it promotes microbial growth. And so any of us who've ever owned a place or showered somewhere, you will see some dark grout lines or dark caulk lines in a shower on the floor, because of course, gravity water comes down and the high moisture areas is where you would see that darkening on ledges and things like that so mold becomes an issue soiling and resoiling becomes an issue it's just unavoidable and then the third thing that we see commonly is Loose grout 
missing route. And that could be for several reasons. For example, new home, a house always settled and I've never really, you know, from my background in construction, I've never really been in a house that's 100% purely square and flush. There's always some slight tilt or adjustment and that's just from home settling. And through time, sometimes on a floor, some grout lines may come out because of the settling and weathering. We're a four season state here in Chicago. Um, another reason is uh, poor installation or poor underlayment. So on ceramic and most natural stones, you're going to see a crack transfer onto the tile. And what do I mean by that? If you have cracking going on, let's say in a cement floor in your basement, and you tiled on top of it, all natural stone and including even ceramics will show that hairline crack and it'll transfer into the tile. Just the nature of it. Now porcelain is a little bit stronger and it's baked differently. So some cracking will not transfer on porcelain. However, will definitely transfer on a marble because that's a softer material. So when it comes to cracking on the actual tile itself, or sometimes the grout line lines up where your butt joints are on your subfloor, you'll see some cracking. The best installation for me is a self-leveled floor, and it's cost more to install this way. However, you'll see people pour a self-leveling cement, grind it down to smooth it, and then install over that. That is a solid install. And especially with the new products coming out now, like some, dual rock cement backer board tiles tile to mortar basically a cement backer board is exactly what it's stated to be cement board so a cement on cement application and then basically you're tiling either vertical or horizontal gives you the best solid structural installation because the cement board unlike three-quarter inch sheathing doesn't expand or contract with the room temperature or the weather whereas if your underlayment is purely wood only we all know wood absorbs moisture and will expand and contract depending on what season it is the same way when you lay a wood floor they always recommend you leave a 3 8 gap at the end for expansion and contraction well in tiles we don't have that kind of expansion and contraction and that's why it's good practices to install tile on top of a cement backer board. That way you don't have to worry about that cracking and, you know, route coming out and things like that. And I only bring that up because in our cleaning process, a client typically would have a few areas of concern where they have missing route, you know, or cracking route where it's, powdery we remove that and then regrout it sometimes it's just a settling issue other times there's something going on behind that like for example in a in a shower or a high moisture area where the grout and the towels are coming loose a lot of that really is a telltale sign that there's a problem to fix behind the tile whether it's vertical or horizontal and so with that said a lot of times, we'll get, can you fill in the grout? Yes, we can definitely fill in the grout. However, we can't guarantee it's going to stay in there because whatever caused the initial grout to come out is probably still there. And so, essentially, we're not fixing the root of the problem. We are pretty much just doing it from a cosmetic and surface only. And I would say 60% of the time, it holds up for a few years. But eventually through time, whatever caused the original grout to come out will resurface and that grout will loosen up. And so that's typically something we see. And then, you know, of course, clients are concerned, well, I just spent the money to put it in there. And a lot of times we tell them, like, there's probably something else and they really don't want to dig too deep into it. And so it becomes kind of this point of we want to tell you that there's probably another issue going on behind there. And it's not something that we do. We don't deal with, you know, structural repairs, foundational repairs and things like that. 
what we do if it's missing we'll put it in we'll clean it we are cleaners by trade so we don't benefit from you cutting the wall out and repairing the tile we just like to make you aware because i believe that helping clients understand what their issues are and why they're having those issues helps make them make an informed decision of what they want to do or what they want to invest in order to either a just get it clean or b fully repair it everything of course depends on the situation and severity and depending on based on where it's at if it can cause further damage so i'm sorry about that rant uh, <laughs> but anyway uh, moving on to my next point which is then we repair the grout well some of this grout is one year old some of it can be 10 years old it's gonna be 20 years old the hardest thing to do for us is to match a grout's pre-existing color 100 percent even if we know the grout and sometimes we're in a client's home where they have the grout they have the grout from original installation tucked away in their basement or in their garage we take the same exact grout mix it and you know cut out the loose stuff and prep the surface for reinstallation we put it in and of course it doesn't match why well because the pre-existing grout has whatever 5 10 15 20 years of wear soil sun foot traffic now we're putting in a fresh brand new grout that has zero wear pattern on there it's like if i took your car that's 10 years old and has sun fading and everything else and we just taped half the car off and painted half let it dry and take the tape off you say well it doesn't look the same of course it doesn't look the same because one has wear and one doesn't even if it's the exact same paint from the manufacturer same product code same exact batch you can't match them and that's the biggest thing that we're we have a disconnect where we try to tell people that and you know some people they just want the whole covered but for other people it's just as bothersome for them to see missing grout as it is to have grout that doesn't match the rest of the floor and i really you know the only solution to that then is one is re-grout the whole floor or two color seal the whole floor and i'll get into color sealing next so from that standpoint we covered a cleaning we covered the common issues that we face now like i said we're at this point where it doesn't match what do you do then you can either a regrout the whole floor which is very costly and time consuming or you can color seal the floor which is a viable option and more economical option however it's not without its butts so let me get into that do we offer color sealing yes we do is it something that we do regularly? I wouldn't say we do it every day. We do it where it makes sense and it's applicable. Just like when we clean, we have four elements of cleaning that we want to use. However, we have to use the four elements that we have when it's applicable. So in this particular part where we talk about color sealing, does color seal work? Yes, it does. Uh, some of the claims for color sealer for stain resistance and everything else absolutely it works just like regular clear seals work as well my not I'm not gonna say issue but my concern with color sealing is this when you color seal a floor or shower especially in a shower though this is very common in shower is that that grout goes through cycles of wet dry wet dry wet dry wet dry and the color seal has a pigment in it and at some point you know basically it's just really like what it looks like is that you painted the grout lines and so after the installation it looks fantastic looks like you just put this floor in right because a nice grout job will make the floor look like it was just installed my biggest issue with this is this especially in a shower and also i'm going to speak particularly in a shower is that through that wet dry cycle some of that color seal is going to peel off right and then you're going to get left with choppy looking grout choppy because the color seal is very bright very vibrant 
versus grout that doesn't have the same vibrance in color. So when that stuff starts peeling, and it's a matter of opinion, some would say it looks even worse than before they had anything done. That's the drawback. Now, can you go back in there, clean that area and color seal it again? Yes. However, my, um, my issue with it is this. If I'm paying for color sealer, grout cleaning, all these things, I want to know, yeah, it'll look great now. I want to know what it is that I'm investing in. Because let's say cost A is just clean and clear seal. Cost B is clean and color seal. Well, two years from now, after all these wet, dry cycles, and I have choppy looking grout, I need to know that when I paid for this two years ago, that it's worth it for me to spend the same amount of money two years later to essentially do the same exact thing, right? And is that worth it for me? And to all of us, that really falls on the individual. For me, I would have to think about it. I'm not, I'm not particularly sure that that's what I would want. In fact, I'd be a 50-50, especially in a high moisture area. In a place where it's just a floor like your foyer, you know, this, you get more out of it because you don't go through that same wet, dry, wet, dry, wet cycle versus a high moisture area. So if you're speaking with me and I'm assisting you with making a decision on what to do with your maintenance for your floor or your walls, I like to consider those factors and explain them to you so that when you make a decision, it's the right decision for you because the right decision for you, I may not agree with. Ultimately, it's your project and it's what makes you feel right about how your money is spent for the quality of service that's being delivered. And I hope that makes sense. I'm sorry, again, I'm ranting. But it, these are the real conversations that we go through every day, on the phone, in emails, when we look at a project, during the project, after the project even. We'll get calls three months after we service a floor or a shower or a wall or a countertop. And these are the conversations we have. And again, these videos are motivated by you guys, our clients, the people who call us daily. Because these are the conversations that are not had every day. We have them with you every day, but people who are maybe new to our service or to our industry, they don't realize what goes into it. And a lot does, trust me. And so creating these videos and talking about the things that matter to you from your standpoint and our standpoint as a service provider, keeping in mind that as a service provider, we don't make cleaning solutions. We purchase them for consumption, you know, at a commercial level of what's regulated to not be sold to homeowners where you need professional training. The same thing with caulking, same thing with grout, same thing with sealers, color sealers, and all these things in our industry that we use to deliver our service the best way we can for the results you want. Keeping in mind that we don't make any of this stuff. We are the people who understand how to use it. We make conscious choices about the products we use and the service offerings we make for you so that we can deliver for you. And that's why your emails, your phone calls, your reviews online, all our interactions matter. And in our company, we document all this stuff. We notate all this stuff. And we like to talk about it, send you paperwork, and to which we know you really don't read. And, and that's why we make these videos, is because I know you get our estimate, your work order, your <laughs> SOPs, and all this stuff that we send to most people who skim through them, and I get it. It's a lot of boring jargon, unfortunately. 
we like to for you to understand and educate you but the truth is you're not going to read it we get it so instead we're making videos for you so when you're bored or maybe you're driving you're listening to this and then you understand your service better so we can really bridge that gap of happy or unhappy understanding versus not understanding so that we understand each other you as a consumer and us as a service provider so with that said guys Thank you for listening to this super long rant about grout. Um, again, we make these videos for you to help clarify a lot of the misconceptions common in our industry, um, kind of bridge the gap between understanding the service or what you can do yourself and really what goes into everything that we have involved here. And we really hope to deliver that value for you to deliver that knowledge and understanding. So with that said, if you get a moment and this is valuable to you, give us a like, subscribe to our stuff. We always try to deliver very informative videos about the cleaning industry as it pertains to floors, ceilings, walls, carpet, tile, furniture even. And uh, if you have any questions, you can call us on the links below, email us on the links below. All right, my name is Earl with another episode of FAQs. Have a good one and I'll see you on the next episode.